this is kind of part two of my sermon from last week. Uh, so I want to uh, unpack a little bit further what we feel we're called to here at Bay Vineyard. But before we do that, we're going to read uh, our gospel reading this morning. And uh, so would you once more jump to your feet out of respect for the gospel this morning and uh, let me read one of my, I think one of my favorite passages, one of the favorite things Jesus said from Matthew 11. It says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Please grab a seat. So just a quick recap, because um, while I desperately hope that every single person that calls Bay Vineyard home was either present last week or watched the podcast, I'm aware that, uh, you know, I may live in a fantasy world uh, if, and that probably hasn't happened. Uh, but it bears repeating anyway, because I just want this literally in our bones, because um, we just really have come to this conclusion that what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, like what Jesus is calling us to as individuals and as a church, uh, is to focus on three things, uh, to learn increasingly to be with him, to become like Jesus, and to do what Jesus did. And we unpacked those three things last week. Um, but can I just say, the best pursuit uh, and like the best way you can spend your life is orientating them around these three things. Like that's the wisest move you can make is to orientate your life around learning to be with Jesus. As I said last week, billions of dollars have been spent to distract you every day. Like there is a war that has been going on for the secret place for our devotional lives and we're fighting tooth and nail to restore that. So to be with Him. Secondly, to become like Him. We sung about that then. God wants to change you. He wants to bring you to life. Uh, and that happens when you eat humble pie. One of the words that came, we pray every before every service, uh, Lord, what do you want to do today? One of the words that came this morning was like, he wants to remind us that we've got to become like little children to enter into the kingdom of God. And you know what, uh, what Jesus is especially pointing to there, and I've explored those texts in depth, is humility. It's humility, the humility of a child to say, yes, I want that, I need that. Uh, and so we live in this very, very proud culture. But what it means to be transformed from glory to glory means to ring, pick up the phone and, and ring the counsellor to work through that brokenness that keeps getting triggered <laughs> or to come up the front and receive prayer ministry or to confess your sin to somebody or whatever. Like that's what it looks like. And that's why pride stops us from, from coming fully alive with, or fear or all sorts of things. But he's the safest place we can go. <laughs> Wise move. I've been in counselling so much. I've responded to so many altar calls. You have no idea. I've confessed so much sin, and it's made me whole. And we continue that journey. And lastly, to do what he did. And that's just to live a life of love rather than self-centeredness. Share our faith, to use um, the gifts that God's given us, not to live for ourselves, but to bless others. And so last week, I invited us as a community to say yes to Jesus again. Because you don't just say yes to Jesus when you decide that he's saviour, because he's actually first and foremost meant to be Lord, you just get saviour thrown in the whole mix, which is great. So I'm like, yes, there's that moment where you say yes to Jesus, big yes, and if you haven't said that yet, we'd love to encourage you to do that. But the reality of the Christian walk is that you've got to keep saying yes to Jesus every single day. And then there's certain moments every couple of years where there's a big intersection that comes again that says, will you trust him even more? And you've got to say yes to him again. And particularly when it comes to our vision as a church, because there's such power in unity, like there's a blessing on unity. God commands a blessing. And so like, this is why we preach vision every, at the start of every year, because I'm like, man, this is important for us. Um, but how do you say yes to this vision in terms of our church? Well, last week, I guess there's five things that I'd love you to do, to say yes to. Firstly, to say, yeah, I'm going to practice the way of Jesus. We're going to unpack that a little bit more today. Uh, secondly, to do that in community. There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. So get into a huddle, upper click or a home church. On all of these things, by the way, June's just amping about talking to you at the end of the service at the info desk, because that's where you go if you want to say yes to one of these things that you haven't said yes to yet, right? So to commit to a community, gather on Sundays. Uh, this year I'm actually going up a year going, this is a healthy and holy habit, you should come. And like, how many Sundays is it cool not to turn up? I don't know. 
Go, like, you've got to work it out. Of course, like, you know, you've got a long weekend. I'm not saying you can't go away. But if you're in town, and like, they'll normally, if you're married, there'll be one, one person a little stronger than the other in the marriage in terms of their faith. You've got to just be that person. No, we're going to church. It's what we do. It's a habit. You know, I tell you what, if the McKinleys can come to church and the Means can come to church with all of their preschoolers, then you guys can come to church. Legends. You know, honestly, the thing that makes me, me proud as punch is the number of kids in our preschool. Because you don't come to church when you've got a preschooler because it's just an easy morning. You come to church because you're with a preschooler because you do not want to get out of the habit of meeting together. Because an off ramp at those preschool years. So, so someone needs to say in that marriage, no, we go. That's what we do. It's a healthy and holy habit. And, and you never know what God's going to do. But regardless, you turn up. That was a total rant. Anyway, I'm going to keep moving. Serve, give. All right. <laughs> they don't even like fuel. Thank goodness. Didn't go there. Tuned to last week. So this week I want to unpack a little bit deeper about what it means to say yes to Jesus. Because here's the thing. We can have a vision, but it's one thing to have a vision. It's another thing to live a vision. And it's really easy. Like this is the easiest bit when it comes to vision. And I'm a vision caster. I love this. I'm so happy. Last night I was like, can't wait to get to church and keep telling Baby, you know what I think the Lord's calling. I love this. Honestly, I'm frothing, right? And this is a red line. And it's, but, but it's so easy to do this. On Tuesday morning when you haven't slept much and your boss has been a real muppet the day before and your kids have kept you up all night and, the, and you kick the cat and all the rest of it, Hard to live a vision then. Hard to live a vision when you're grumpy. Hard to live a vision when you're tired. Hard to live a vision when you're feeling wounded and hurt. Hard to live a vision when you're grieving. Right? So I'm like, how do you just consistently live a vision? Because we know that we're meant to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour. We know that we're meant to grow up in every way, but how do we do that? And I think sometimes we can get super jaded about living a vision and about change. Because many of us, if you go to the next slide, Ramon, um, have lived in this cycle for way too long, where you get in this environment, you hear a preacher rev you up, and you're like, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to try harder. And then you try harder, but you don't last very long. How's everyone's New Year's resolutions going? 97% of them's done by now. You know, right? And then, you're like, and then you feel like, I'm the worst Christian. Who's felt that? I'm just the worst Christian ever. I'm just the worst Christian. I can never do it. And then uh, you feel guilty. Then you come to church or you go to a conference. Oh, I'm going to do it again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live for Jesus. I'm going to fast every other Thursday. And it's like, I'm going to sit on something sharp every morning and like, you know, sing God. And it's like, it's like, and then it, like that cycle, right, just continues and continues. And and I'm calling us as a church to maturity afresh this morning, but I'm saying it's okay if you felt like this, but, but this is again uh, where the focus of the Western church in only recent history has been primarily on information rather than on practicing the way of Jesus. And so this is actually the biblical pattern. Next slide. It's actually, it's meant to look like this. I see something, I have a revelation of what it looks like to follow Jesus, and then I practice it. It's like learning an instrument. It's like learning a trade. It's like I'm an apprentice. I, I just, I practice it. I know I'm going to be rubbish at the start, but I'm determined to keep practicing the way of Jesus. And as you make that resolution in your heart, it releases a blessing over your life in time. I said this in a sermon last year. The thing about spiritual practices is that initially we do them, it's quite fun. And it's like, yay, I'm finally reading my Bible. And then it's like a week later, you're not again. And, uh, and it's exposing this is what spiritual practice, they actually expose brokenness. But if you continue to journey in community together with the goal of following Jesus, eventually you crack through. I can promise you that because that's been my story. Eventually you crack through and it releases blessing over your life. Sabbath is very exposing, but you keep not giving up and you keep trying to practice it. Eventually there's just this new space of blessing that gets released over your life. Uh, and so here's what first point this morning and it's more of a buffet sermon than points but I'm just going to say this is a point here's my first point this morning hear this from the Lord don't give up don't give up it's, it's tough following Jesus Jesus said it would be he said it's a narrow road he says you've got to pick up your cross but don't give up don't let the devil just say oh that's just the way you are 
No, you're not. He wants to transform you from glory to glory. You can be changed into His image. You can have a deep devotional life. You can live, live from a place of rest rather than adrenaline. You can, you can be there like dialing down anxiety rather than raising it in the environment around you. You can do this stuff. You can walk the way of Jesus. You can learn to be with Him and to become like Him and do what He did. Don't you dare believe the enemy who says, oh no, you can't do it. You're too much of a mess. The Bible's filled with messy people. This pastor's a very messy person. If he can use us, he can use anyone. Hallelujah. He loves taking ordinary, messy, weak, vulnerable people who just are determined to keep saying yes to him, and that's the people he uses to change the world. Hallelujah. Pete Scazzaro says, nurturing a growing spirituality with depth in our present day, in our present day culture, will require a thoughtful, conscious intentional plan for our spiritual lives. Like, information is not enough. We have to have intention. This is how I want to live my life. Which brings us to um, what I want to speak to this week, which you've got in your hand, which is uh, this idea of a rule of life. Now, this concept uh, has been kicking around Bay Vineyard um, behind the scenes for a, a couple of years now. So people have been engaging with this concept. But, uh, but this is the first time we've gone from the front, all right, church, now we use this. Now, let me unpack what we mean by this and what this means for us as a church in terms of how we live a vision. A rule of life is actually just simply a schedule, a set of practices and relational rhythms that make space for what Jesus calls abiding. It's a rule of, so here's something of a backstory of this whole concept of a rule of life. What's interesting throughout the Old Testament is that God will turn up and make promises or make covenants with his people. And in response to that love and that covenant and that initiation from God, the people would make a commitment back to God. Here's what my life is going to look like now that I walk into that covenant. And uh, as things evolved, people started making vows. There was the uh, Nazarite vow. Um, and uh, John the Baptist took that Nazarite vow, which meant certain things that marked you as being dedicated to the way of God. Uh, most likely Paul, and you can read this in Acts chapter 18, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, took that Nazarene vow himself. So they, they made a rule of life and a commitment. Now, as the church kind of moves forward, uh, it begins under enormous um, cultural pressure through the Roman culture uh, and at times under intense persecution. But because of the witness of the early church, uh, eventually this thing like starts to go kind of viral, like it's the subversive viral spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire to the point where Constantine in AD 30, uh, 300, sorry, is like, he realizes, man, like most of Jerusalem are Christian now, like, it, like over 50, 60 percent of at this point are, are following Jesus. Now, whether he does this for political reasons, which would make sense, or whether legitimately he was like, I think Jesus is who he says he is, people debate all that stuff. But at the end of the day, he's like, all right, friends, Christianity is now the state religion of the Roman Empire. This is significant. It's like it's gone from this persecuted minority to now the state religion. Yay! It's like, cool, no more gladiatorial fights, no more worshipping the Caesars like their deities, like their gods. Everyone's like, well, that's pretty good, right? Everyone's like, what did we say, yes or no? I don't know how to react to this because I don't want to like, get embarrassed. Well, good work for being quiet, smart move, because uh, <laughs> historians really just go, man, you know what? It was almost a death blow. It was almost a death blow for the church. Instead of the way of Jesus getting into the empire, the empire started getting into the church. And it was major, there was major, major compromise. Because whenever the church historically buddies up to power politically, it always leads to spiritual power, powerlessness. Which is why I get very concerned about, you know, what's happened in the States in the last number of, of years. Because I'm like, this is not healthy for the church when it gets political influence. It's, it's really unhealthy. It just loses. The church has always thrived on the margins and always gets watered down and diluted when it compromises in that way. Um, and so thankfully, people saw that there was major compromise starting to happen in the church and it had lost its potency. 
And they were like, man, we are, de- they were like, we are determined to see the church recover its prophetic identity. And so all of these cats uh, went out into the desert. They're called the desert mothers and fathers in, the, in the about the AD 300s and so onwards, where they're like, nah, 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 nah. We're going to be radical and we're going to follow the way of Jesus. And they set up communities that then eventually formed into what we know now as monasteries. And within that community, they would form an agreement about how they were going to live so that the love of God was at the center and they could live a prophetic lifestyle counter to the culture around them. And that was called a rule of life. Uh, And so this slowly morphed into the uh, tool that I want us to explore today um, because the church was revived when people made this commitment called this rule of life. Now let me unpack a little bit more what this is and John Mark Comer does a great book, uh, a great uh, job of this in his book, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. He says this, a rule was a schedule and a set of practices to order your life around the way of Jesus in community. It was a way to keep from being getting sucked into the hurry, busyness, noise, and distraction of regular life. A way to slow down, a way to live into what really mattered, what Jesus called abiding. Now, this is important. Don't let the language of a rule put you off. The word rule actually comes from the Latin word regular, which literally means a straight piece of wood, but it was also used as the word for trellis. What's underneath every single thriving vine? It's a trellis, a structure to hold up the vine so it can grow and bear fruit. So that was the concept with the rule of life. Let's put some structures and a container and some systems in place so that my life can grow healthily and bear much fruit, like Jesus said in John 15, using the metaphor of a vine. Now, I'm no vineyardist. Vineyardite. What do you, what do you call Bruce? Huh? Viticulture. Plants come to our place to die. Uh, so I, I've got no authority here. Um, and, and, uh, but I'm sure Bruce and others can testify that you've got to have that structure there to make the vine grow healthy. A vine will grow without a trellis. We just are so not used to seeing it. It will grow there. But what will happen? The rodents will eat the fruit. And it doesn't get enough light uh, for the fruit to grow healthily. And in the same way, without some sort of structure around your life, your life will grow it just won't bear a lot of fruit and it's vulnerable to attack. So we need a structure. Uh, and so in Matthew 11, Jesus, which we read out earlier, Jesus says, come to me and rest. Don't we love that? Don't we need that? Isn't that beautiful that he says, come to me and learn how to really rest? I love it. But he doesn't stop there. So how do you do that? By taking up a yoke by putting something on your life that yokes you to Jesus. If you want the life of Jesus, you have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. And many of us have wanted the life of Jesus with the lifestyle of this world and have wondered why our souls keep shriveling and dying and we are withering, as Jesus says in John 15. So if you want the life of Jesus, you need the lifestyle of Jesus. You get yoked to him. Yoked literally like a bit of wood that gets stuck on your shoulders and on his shoulders and you work together. And again, you still work. A yoke is made for work. For work. So you're engaged in activity, but it's at the pace of Jesus. Hallelujah. He's with you. Hallelujah. You're learning to walk in step with him. And so um, now whatever your, your personality is, um, there is, oh, sorry, there's this lovely quote, we achieve inner peace when our schedule is aligned with our values. I think that's, that's super profound. Now, here's the thing. Whenever you start talking about this sort of stuff, some people, your legs twitching, you're all over it because you're like mathematicians or engineers or like Marie Kondo fans and everything in your life has got all this kind of thing going on and you love the idea of a rhythm and a structure. And some of you are thinking, oh, I bet your Harvey's like that. I am not like that. I'm a mess. I'm loose. I'm creative. I'm not structured. And here's what I've learned over the last 20 plus years following Jesus very seriously, is that the more loose you are, the more you need some structure. Like you've got to move into maturity with how you're wired. And so for me, I need this stuff more than the the, the person that's by default a bit structured needs it. Because otherwise my plan's going to go kind of crazy. And so I've loved this. It's, and, and again, it hasn't squashed me. It's brought me to life. It's brought me to maturity. It's brought me into wholeness. Uh, and so I'm massively, uh, I think it's super important. Uh, and I've seen so much fruit from applying these sorts of concepts to my life. 
I remember reading about this guy called Charles Simeon. He died in 1836. He was an Anglican minister back in the day. And he was a real legend because he was like he would preach Jesus with such an anointing, and people would get super agitated in his sermons, and uh, powerful church members would interrupt them, and like they would block him out of church. He was just this anointed man of God that just carried his presence. People flocked to hear him speak. And then, like yeah, I was reading his biography a number of years ago, and I read this: Simon uh, Simeon invariably rose every morning, though it was winter season, at four o'clock, and he devoted himself the first four hours of the day to private prayer and the devotional study of the scriptures. Immediately, I'm like, I hate you, Simeon, so much. I just like there's nothing about that that resonates. And I'm like, you're one of those structured types, aren't you? That loves doing that sort of thing. You're like a little friggin' I don't know, Tony Robbins guy there. That's all. And so I get, I go to that whole track, and then, and literally, I'm reading this biography, reading that, uh, just thinking all that. And then li- the next line just cracked me up and I felt like God was like, yeah, I got you. Uh, this is a, the next line. The early rising did not come easily to him. It was a habit resolutely fought for and acquired. I was like, oh. And then listen, finding himself too fond of his bed, <laughs> He had resolved to pay a fine for every time he slept in, giving a half crown to his servant. And then the story continues that he then starts to justify why his servant needs the money. So he sleeps in a whole lot more. And then he's like, no. So he ups the ante, he gets a guinea, which is like a money, not an animal. And he he throws it into the river every time he sleeps in to again, just hold himself accountable to this rule of life that he wants to live. And where does the anointing come from? From public ministry, it comes from the private place. No wonder the guy was anointed. But like, so I'm like, man, it doesn't matter who we are, we can actually fight for these habits and acquire them. And again, I'm standing before you as a witness to the fact that can happen for the loosest of us. You can fight for habits and you can acquire them. And so uh, again, as I've been exploring this, I've been geeking out because I'm like, I actually think God's moving in the church across the world at the moment, restoring discipleship to the church. It's early days. It's very different from the charismatic renewal and some of these other movements of the Holy Spirit and church history, but it's no less significant. I would contend it's more. It just looks very different. But he's restoring discipleship to the church. There's such an anointing on it. Like, honestly, I can't tell you how many ch- churches are ringing me and trying to, like, because they can recognize that God's on something here when it comes to discipleship around the world. So I'm like, how do you steward a rule, like a move of God? How do you steward? Well, interestingly, in church history, we can get an idea. Um, in the fifth century, the next slide, uh, the next, uh, oh, okay, that's also a really important thing. Here's the thing. You may think, uh, I didn't realize it was in there and that was on. I mean, you already have a rule of life. It's just whether it's good or not. You already have a rhythm that you spend your days. You've already got a schedule. You've already got defaults around how you live. It's not about whether you have a rule of life, whether it's formed around the way of Jesus to help you form you into a person of love. And like how many of us have got that rule of life going on right now, right? So, okay. so anyway, if you want to steward a move of God, here's, here's some stuff in, in, in history. St. Benedict um, started uh, really the modern monastic movement, had a rule of life, and again, this transformed the church and restored its potency. Count Zinzendorf, um, how cool is that name? Just by the way, I'd love to be Count something, especially Count Zinzendorf. Anyway, he was the founder of the Moravian movement, which started the modern-day global missions movement. It started, it got birthed out of 24-7 prayer from a congregation of two or 300 people that just prayed continuously for 100 years, 24-7, and that turned the the world upside down. Countless moves of God were birthed out of what Count Zinzendorf did. And they had, uh, if you're part of their thing, they had this honourable order of the mustard seed, which was a rule of life that held that move of God together. John Wesley, the leader of, again, a massive move of God, that, that move of God, and I've read this incredible book called Marks of a Movement, was held together by Wesley's Holy Club, where people got together and asked questions every week on how their following Jesus was going. And the fascinating thing with that move of God is that when they went to the States, eventually they stopped having the Holy, the holy Club in midweek and the move of God just wasn't freeful from that moment afterwards. They had weekly accountability around the way of Jesus. That's how this thing was stewarded. Charles Finney, who was the leader of the Great Awakening in America, had this whole thing going on. His final sermon was called The Christian's Rule of Life. And he says, to live what we are living right now into maturity, to age this new wine into a fine vintage, we're going to need a vow of commitment. 
together. Mother Teresa ordered her personal life and her community life around a humility list. Billy Graham had a shared rule of life that was called the Modesto Manifesto that they, again, the core guys agreed to live out. All of these people stewarded moves of God in the church and underneath the hood was a rule of life, a communal commitment. This is how we're going to live. And so uh, I want us to, I want to call us to this because again, I don't want to just have a vision with some people. I'm like, I want us to, ha- to have a vision and then to be living the vision through a rule of life. So on here, uh, we've got some key practices and I'm going to unpack how you can make your own rule of life today. Now, just to be super clear, um, now, this is where everyone's like, oh no, this is turning, are we, actually, are we becoming a monastery? Because um, again, I am very uh, intrigued with the idea of being an abbot. That would be quite cool. Uh, abbot, abbot Harvey. Um, no, you're not having to become nuns and monks. Um, because here's, here's the thing. Uh, these things have served the church and, have gone, and go right back throughout the scriptures. Um, but we are in a new covenant of grace. Some of you goes, oh no, this is getting too legalistic for me. Here's the thing. You don't have to do it. Invitation. Secondly, we're not telling you what to do. We're just going to give you some guidelines. So it's Holy Spirit led. What's the Holy Spirit leading you into? So it's not, whereas if you went to a monastery, you'd have to agree to these things. It's prescriptive. Here it is. Here it's more like, no, we want to just put this in front of you as a phenomenal tool to live a vision of following the way of Jesus. And now the rest is up to you. But here's, here's some building blocks that I think um, are helpful to have the, uh, the love of God at the center of your life. Firstly, and you'll notice on here, life with God. What are the spiritual disciplines that you need to anchor your life with God? We've talked a lot about this. Sunday services and prayer and that sort of stuff. Um, so I won't, I won't labor this point. Second one, rest. How important is this? What are the practices of self-care you need to care for your body and nurture your soul? Like, What does Sabbath look like for you? How rich and beautiful could that day be? How can you lean into that a little bit more this year? Sunday's a great day for Sabbath. Worship together. Saturday's a busy day doing jobs around the house. Come here, worship. Nice big lunch. Nap if you can. Must be nice, some of you. You know, food that's just epic all day. Treats galore. You know, movie of the kid. Like, how can you just fill your soul? On a set? Like, how can you rest really well? To care for your soul, like some of you, it's like counselling is important. I love that we're constantly paying for people to go to counselling in this church. We'd love to help you if that's something you need. It's one of the, I love that our tithes and offerings go to helping that folks out. I've done lots of it. It helps you just find rest for your soul because it's hard to rest in your soul when it's wounded and broken. Bedtimes. Yeah? It's like, it's just, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Things get thrown at me. <laughs> um, but it's like, again, isn't it time we mature so that we've got like a space for people? A few mums looking at me like, how dare you mention rest? In the, how dare you? I'm going to talk through, I'm going to literally go public on my rule of life today, but exercise is one of them. Um, relationships. So who do you need to... Um, who do you need to spend time with in this? There's no solitary Christians. Accountability is, is utterly transforming. Um, and, uh, and so huddles and upper clicks, all that stuff. And then lastly, mission. And again, we've got a very broad definition of mission. Often that's been reduced to just people that are wired like evangelists, but we're all called to be witnesses. And some people have the grace and office of evangelism on them. But actually to live a missional life is to live a life of blessing for others. How can we live a life just blessing others? Your workplace, the poor, that lonely person at your school, whatever it is, like that's what it looks like to live a life of mission. So um, it's incredibly potent, uh, this, this whole rule of life idea. Um, because, and here's a couple of reasons why. Then I'm just going to um, share what I've got, and then we're going to come into land. But the reason that it's so potent is because it, it helps us put, it aligns our values with our schedule, right? So it's like, instead of like, your boss dictating what should be the most important time, you know, things that you do with your time or the culture or whatever it is. Like often we have all these narratives that say, I'm so busy, I can't slow down. And actually if you unpack those, that thought process, a lot of them aren't as strong as you think. 
you can take the reins of your life back and get some control over how you use your time. And what rule of life does is says, the big priorities for me, the big building blocks of my life, they go in first and then other things can get put on top rather than all the little things then we're trying to squeeze in the, the big Jesus things. So it aligns our values with our schedule because actually the reason you're in the room this morning is because you want to follow him. No one turns up to church, to, mm, we're not really sure about it, but I'll come. Certainly in this day and age, it's not worth it. How, do you know how good some of the cafes are and the weather's pretty good today and yesterday was rubbish and here you still are? Come on, super, super Christian award, you know, make it rain Bibles or whatever. It's like you've done well. Legend. So, so of course, but, but deep inside you, you know that he's the way, the truth and the life. So when you start going, that's it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a schedule together that, that reflects my priorities and values, then things start getting potent in terms of how you start living your life with intention that be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what he did. That's the center for you. And then all the rest, it goes from there. Super helpful. Secondly, the reason it's so potent is because a rule of life, for it to be a rule of life, has to be shared in community. You have to tell someone what your rule of life is. It's not a rule of life if you don't share it with someone. So I'm fine with the fact there'll be a bunch of you that will go home and will fill this out, but you're not there yet in terms of being able to share this with someone. It's still helpful. But it's nowhere near as potent than when you sit down with someone and say, here's what my rule of life is. Can you help me live it? We've got this funky thing with accountability where it's got this negative mind connotation for us because we think it's sharing the worst thing about us. I'm going to share with you the filthiest thing I've done. That's accountability. If anyone wants to do that with me right there, I want to share it. No, don't share anything. That's, and, and so we shudder about, but actually accountability in this context is like, here's the great person I want to be. I want to be held accountable to following the way of Jesus so that I come fully alive. It's a totally different form of accountability. And that's why in the last three years or so, we have seen dramatic change in the lives of people in this church who have got together weekly to hold themselves accountable to their devotional practices. And that's the thing that's broken through the billion dollar strong principality and power that's trying to distract you from having no interior life of Jesus. That's the thing that's helped us crack through is to normalize the vulnerability of I need, I need to share this side of my life. And there's all sorts of data and science around why that is. And that's why AA works, that's why Weight Watchers work. Mutual accountability is, is what makes this thing tick. And so uh, get in a huddle if you're not in a huddle. Get in a home church if you're not in a home church. Come to an upper click. Get some relationships where you can actually share this sort of stuff because that's what a rule of life is. It's not an individual pursuit. That's a, that's like, we're not talking New Year's resolutions here. <laughs> we're talking the rule of life around the way of Jesus and it's always done in community. And again, what does that require? Humble pie, everyone's favourite pie. Um, 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 I'm going to eat the humble pie. Uh, and so that's the... And lastly, um, I want to say this. When it comes to... Um, forming a rule of life, if you want it to actually be helpful, it's got to be small changes to where you want to grow. It's not dramatic changes. We're not talking simian levels of devotional things of 4.30 at the morning if you're struggling to read your Bible for two minutes every day, right? We're talking what's a little, that's why we call it up a click for our, our accountability. What's one little click that you want to go up in on life with God, on rest for your soul, on key relationships, and on mission this year? What are those little improvements, little things you want to put a bit of focus into? It's very unlikely big change is going to happen. Now, there's seasons where you go bananas. We had 21 days of prayer and fasting last year, and you go bananas. Fasting hard out, praying hard out. But interestingly, by week three, people are struggling. And some people got pretty quiet in terms of feedback to me about how awesome it is. <laughs> That's okay. Because it's hard to make big changes stick, little changes in the way of Jesus. And we keep doing that. Uh, and, and lastly, lastly, these things are living documents. They're here to serve you, not you serve it. So I'm constantly tweaking it. And over summer, I need a whole new rule of life because my schedule changes completely. And then I've just realized over the last couple of weeks, I actually need another rule of life for when I'm back at work, but the kids are still home. Hey, like it's just a nightmare. I hate it so much and I can't wait for Wednesday. Hallelujah. Come Lord Jesus. It's, uh, uh, and because I'm like, I've written out my whole rule of life that it's impossible to live with three lovely little boys charging around our home while I've got a home office. Again, please give so we can get a building. I need it real bad. Um, so... So here's kind of what my one looks like. You're not going to be able to see it that, that much. 
um, in terms of uh, the detail there and because of my handwriting. But there's just a whole lot. So what I've done is that on the little uh, lines underneath, I've just written down like what those things look like for, for me in terms of um, you know, my devos. I've written out like, what does your devotional life look like? So for me, Bible in a year, uh, along this year, the little twic, uh, little upper click for me is I'm uh, parallel to that. I'm using a, a very simple commentary to help me go a bit deeper in the text. Um, I, uh, and then use some set prayers that help me pray with greater intention because uh, prayer is primarily about forming me, not telling God what I think he should do. So set prayers help me pray prayers that are wiser and deeper and more forming. Um, gratitude's a, a, a part of my devotional things because uh, I'm prone to melancholy and depression and I have wonderful moments on Sunday when lots of people come and then I'm always very melancholic on Monday morning so I've got to write down things I'm grateful for simply because of the you know the physiological aspect of this job. Um, so I practice great. You know, those sorts of things are in there. Um, I'm praying the Lord's Prayer every lunchtime. A little reminder comes up. Me and Jen um, uh, pray before we go to sleep every night, and Jen's been carrying that in our marriage for way too long, and so 13 years, so I'm now, we're taking every other night's my turn now, because I'm normally starting to conk out, and Jen's very good at holding that line together. So again, that's an area I can grow in. Um, rest, uh, things like Sabbath, um, and this is where exercise for me is, um, is again, uh, don't think dualistic, exercise isn't spiritual, exercise is very spiritual. Um, it's, man, like I meet God on the runs and all that sort of stuff, but also for my mental health it's super important, to flush out stress it's it's important Um, and so here's what was so encouraging over summer, not on the exercise front, trust me that was a dumpster fire again but um, but you know, like in my devotional life, like um, that stuff sounds impressive for some people and some people are like, oh that sounds pretty, but you know what, like I, I was a pastor 10 years ago with very little interior life with Jesus. Do you know how horrible that is? You think you feel like you're a bad Christian? Try feeling like a bad pastor where you're just, you're just, you blame the job for the fact you're so busy and you don't have an interior life with Jesus. And um, John Aubrey says everything's set up in the, in, the, being a past, in the job of being a pastor to stop you having an interior life with Jesus. You have to fight for it as much as anyone does. And so I just had to fight for it. So no, I don't want to live like this. And, um, and like I just haven't given up. Like, again, it's, I kind of cycle back to that. The, the reason I have a life with Jesus isn't because I nailed it from get-go. It's because I failed all the time but resolved I was never going to give up. I was going to get back on the wagon. I was going to get, dust myself up, and, and I was going to do it again. And, and, like, over summer, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. It's moved from something I have to keep choosing. It's slowly, I think, morphing into something just who I am. Like, it's just who I am. Like, and I noticed this with Jen with exercise. So, like, Jen is just a phenomenal person with exercise. It's so annoying. I like just really good at it. And, like, but it dawned on me because if Jen doesn't exercise in the day, it's a weird day for her. Like, she's like, eh, it just feels weird. It's not, like, it hasn't been a, there's something not quite right about the day. Uh, so, she just has to do that every day. I'm not there yet by a long way on the exercise, but thank goodness I've got there with my devos. And you will too. It will become who you are. I'm just a person who does that every day. And so I, I, for exercise, I need goals. So I've got like, a, I'm going to run a half, the half marathon in May and I'm doing some swimming stuff. So I've got my rule of life, like when that's happening, all that sort of stuff for my mental health, for my physical health, all the rest of it, because it needs to be in my rule of life. I need to put it in the diary and structure it so that my values, my diary aligns with my values. Relationships, those sorts of things, mission, uh, I, won't, I won't dive deep into all that sort of stuff. And the tricky thing for my job as well is that a lot of my job is, is centred around that. So, um, but, and so, yeah, and so I've got that in my... So then I've put it in, as you can see on there. Um, and then I've got at the bottom there, what do we need termly? Because you get your weekly rule of life. But um, termly, I need to get away and have a, a night away for a retreat just to really seek God somewhere. Um, I, me and Jen need to have a, a, a getaway. Um, I need to do some surfing. Um, again, thank, thank, you know, hallelujah, thank you for that. Uh, and then annually you've got stuff like um, holidays um, and I need fitness goals throughout my year, blah, 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 blah. So um, the invitation this morning is that you would, um, you would get a rule of life so that we don't just have a vision as a church but that we live a vision as a church. And this is an invitation. I'm not going to check up on all of this stuff and all the rest of it, but I can just stand before you today saying, Every move of God historically has had a people that have been committed to a rule of life when they've stewarded a, a renewal. And I want us to be people that steward the presence of God, that steward what he's doing right now. He's bringing the church to life again. 
and I want you to be a part of it. And I think a rule of life, a com- a, a, in response to his love, a commitment back to him that says, You'll lo- I want to live a life of love where you are at the center. And so here's the commitment I make to you. Filled with grace because I'm going to fail, but I'm not going to give up because I'm going to keep choosing the way of Jesus. And so that's the invitation this morning. I finish with these two scriptures and then I'd love to pray some, for some folks this morning. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says this. When I was a child... I taught like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Uh, Colossians 1.28, he is the one that we proclaim, admonishing, teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Here's, here's my, my last thought. Friends, and I sense this actually as a word for our church, he wants to, to move us into greater maturity this year. Now, that's a, there's a structural stuff around that and systems that we need to do to mature as a church. There's big picture stuff that we're working on. But also, some of you guys have been stuck in patterns that are childish for too long, and it's time you step up and become a man. Put the childish ways behind you and start actually living the way that God wants you to live. Because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So you've got to break that. And this is a, and you know, uh, for me, those low moments in life of depression and realizing my interior life was a mess and all the rest of it turned out to be the greatest gift because I was like, stuff it. I'm not living like this anymore. I'm getting a new schedule. I'm getting a new rule of life and I'm putting some place, some stuff in place in my life so I walk into greater wholeness and health. And it doesn't happen overnight, but it will happen. But it will happen if you keep choosing the way of Jesus. Amen.